Good afternoon. I'm Michael Munson with FORGE. The topic of today's webinar is sheltering non-binary survivors of intimate partner violence. I'm glad that you're here with us today to explore this very um, not often discussed topic. As we get started today, I want to make uh, a note up front that we'll spend a fair amount of time today talking about who non-binary people are prior to discussing sheltering specific um, issues. Many people are less familiar with non-binary identities than other gender identities, so that's why we're going to spend a little bit more time up front. If you'd like even more information about trans or non-binary identities and topics, we encourage you to uh, look more at our website where there's a, a lot of fact sheets and publications and webinars that are, are specifically designed for victim service providers. So our web address is forge-forward.org. Many of you who have been on a webinar of ours in the past or an in-person training have seen this, this slide. So it's just another reminder for all of us to take care of ourselves. And you know, if that means stepping out in the middle of the webinar, that's, that's totally fine. The, the webinar is being recorded, and you can come back to it at any point in time. So please do what you need to do to take care of yourself. We want to thank um, the Office of Violence Against Women again for their continued support of the work that we're doing with trans survivors and, and helping victim service providers become better able to serve trans survivors. So thank, the, thank you to them and um, you know, please enjoy all of the, the webinars that they've allowed us to record and, and make available to you. Let me start out with telling you a little bit about who FORGE is. Um, FORGE is a trans organization that is 100% funded to focus on anti-violence issues related to trans and non-binary survivors of sexual assault, domestic and dating violence, and stalking. We're headquartered in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, but our work is national. We were founded in 1994, initially providing social support, information, and education within the trans community, and then sp expanded outward to train providers in later years. From the beginning, we had a more expansive and overt inclusion um, within the trans community than many of our peer organizations. An over overwhelming number of people we served back in 1994 uh, through the, the community members um, we serve today, identify as non-binary, genderqueer, or gender non-conforming. Approximately 75% of our time focuses on working with victim service providers, providing training and technical assistance. The remaining 25% of our staff time is spent working directly with trans and non-binary survivors and loved ones. Our role as a technical assistance provider has allowed us to directly see key continued and emerging challenges many agencies have um, in preparing to work with and actually do um, and, and actually are serving um, trans survivors and survivors of all genders. Our work is rooted in two foundational principles. First um, is being trauma-informed, and the second is being empowerment-focused in all of the work that we do, both with survivors and with victim service providers. We're also guided by research and evidence-based strategies. As you'll see today, we have a lot of data that's going to be included in today's webinar. Um, but we're also highly aware that when working with marginalized populations, that sometimes the most successful solutions are charting new territory and creating new best practices. And we're, we're grateful that some of you are part of creating those best practices with us. We have a long history of crafting dynamic and in-person, remote access, and print-based training materials in ways that we hope are highly accessible to many different types of victim service providers, as well as different types of, of learning styles and, and skills. We want you to know that we're here to support you in the work that you do with trans and non-binary survivors. And some of what we have to offer you are uh, 50 hours of archived webinars that are, are that archive is growing every every year. Um, we have fact sheets and tip sheets that are quick reference guides. We also have longer written materials that offer a lot more in-depth information about specific subjects. We have guides that are specific to trans survivors and loved ones. And we also do a lot of direct one-on-one -on -one technical assistance and on-demand um, or on-request training. 
we also support you in working with trans survivors and non-binary clients by having an active presence on three different platforms of social media. We encourage you to, to like us and follow us on Twitter or Facebook or Instagram, and we will we'll try to like you back, and um, we can learn from each other in, in that format. So if you're live tweeting today as you watch, we encourage you to use the hashtag of NBShelter, so non-binary shelter, and tag us in your posts. So a little bit about who's who. Um, again, I'm Michael Munson, and I'm Forge's executive director and primary trainer. And Lori Cook Daniels is here as well, and she is our policy and program director and our main writer. We're happy that all of you are here with us today, and we're going to explore how to better shelter and serve non-binary survivors. A little bit about our agenda for today. As I noted earlier, we'll be spending a substantial amount of time talking about who non-binary individuals are, including sh sharing some new data from the 2015 U.S. Transgender Survey. We'll share data on rates of intimate partner violence and sexual assault before moving on to briefly discussing the VAWA non-discrimination conditions, so the Violence Against Women Act non-discrimination conditions. Unlike the trans men and trans women and shelter webinars uh, that we've recorded already, we will spend very little time reviewing shelter placement and logistics. Instead, we're going to highlight um, some of the key issues through three case examples. Um, and we hope that that will be a better way and a more effective way to, to talk about uh, bias and, and some of the other issues that come up. As we often do, we'll wrap up with some resources and reminders. So what does it mean when someone says that they are non-binary? There's an enormous variety and complexity of identity, experiences, and language for how people talk about and define their own gender. We also want to be very clear from the beginning that non-binary individuals are just one segment of the trans and non-binary community. This webinar, as I just mentioned, is one of three that focuses on trans people and non-binary people in shelter. So the other two are uh, you know, one for trans women, one about trans women, and one about trans men. So these three subgroups uh, really can't capture the fullness of identities and experiences that trans people embody. But we know that these are the three areas that you will probably have, have survivors coming to you that, that kind of fall under one of those general categories. We also know and trust that you serve every survivor and treat every survivor um, as an individual, as unique, and listen to their stories and their histories and their needs. So working with non-binary survivors is, is very much like working with any other survivor. In this webinar, we'll use the term non-binary to refer primarily to people who do not identify as either male or female. Some non-binary individuals also identify as trans or under the trans umbrella. For others, they don't identify as trans. We will also occasionally use the phrase of gender non-conforming. Language, as many of you know, within the, the trans and non-binary communities shifts very rapidly. Gender nonconforming is a term that gained a lot of popularity prior to non-binary, but many people still use both terms or one term or the other. Non-binary people come in all shapes and sizes and colors and abilities and ages and so many more things and, and have a wide range of understandings about their own gender or genders. Rather than being a singular and unified third gender distinct from male and female, non-binary is itself an umbrella term for many people whose identities don't fit into the gender binary of male and female. Some understand their gender as a mix of male and female, some see themselves as completely different gender entirely, and some understand themselves to have no gender whatsoever. Some see their gender as fluid or in flux, changing over the course of a day or a month or a year. Some were assigned male at birth and initially raised as boys. Some were assigned female at birth and initially raised as girls. And some were, um, have an intersex biology. Some non-binary people have an androgynous gender expression with a marked absence of traditionally uh, gendered cues. Um, some intentionally subvert or mix up mainstream gender cues. 
some layer femininity and masculinity on top of each other. And others, gender expression is primarily stereotypically feminine or masculine. Some non-binary people's gender expression changes from day to day or from year to year. Some desire to modify their bodies through the use of hormones or anti-androgen medications or through surgery or through other means, and many do not. Some are out as non-binary to everyone in their life, and others keep their non-binary identity more close to their vest. A person's non-binary identity is separate from how that person expresses their gender or how others perceive their gender. In other words, a person who identifies as non-binary might continue to be perceived by others as the sex that they were assigned at birth because of how they dress or groom or carry their body or present their gender to others. Similarly, a person may have or a non-binary identity and express their gender in binary, normative, or traditionally masculine or feminine ways. This may be due to personal choice in style or could be dictated by uh, aligning with social norms in order to maintain employment or family relationships or for many other reasons. This, may be also, this also may be true for individuals who have physical characteristics that send very binary cues. For example, a person who was assigned male at birth or someone who is taking testosterone or someone who maybe has no head hair um, or perhaps someone who's very tall, um, all might be perceived as male even though they may not identify as male and identify instead as non-binary. Note too that people who identify as non-binary may express their gender in binary ways to maintain a greater level of safety on the streets or at work, with family or friends, or in other circumstances. So how many non-binary individuals are there? We, we really don't know exactly. Um, one of the great new studies that uh, just came out is from the US Transgender uh, Survey from the National Center for Transgender Equality. And they found that 35% of their over 27,000 respondents identified as non-binary. Interestingly, non-binary identities were more prevalent than trans women at 33% of the sample or trans men at 29% of the sample. When asked about what gender they were perceived to be by people who did not know they were non-binary, a majority reported that people usually assumed that they were non-transgender women including 72% of non-binary respondents with female on their original birth certificate and 2% of non-binary respondents with male on their original birth certificate. 17% reported that other people assumed that they were non-transgender men, including 77% of respondents with male on their original birth certificate and 3% of non-binary re respondents with female on their birth certificate. Nearly one in five reported that assumptions uh, of about their gender varied. Non-binary respondents were asked about were asked how they responded when people in their life assumed their gender was something other than non-binary. Almost half, or 44 percent, reported that they usually let others assume that they were a man or a woman, and 53 percent sometimes corrected others and told them about their non-binary identity. Only 3% always told others that they were non-binary. So why not correct others about their gender? Non-binary respondents who reported that they usually let others assume that they were a man or a woman, or only sometimes told people that they were non-binary, were asked for the main reasons that they do not tell others about their non-binary identity. A majority of non-binary respondents reported that people uh, do not understand, so they do not want to even try to explain, um, or that it's just easier to not say anything. Approximately two-thirds reported that their non-binary identity is often dismissed as not being real, or a real identity, or as just a phase. Others feared that they might face violence. These are critical pieces of information since they let us know that oftentimes non-binary people are, bringing their, are not bringing their whole selves into interactions that they have with others, frequently due to constant uphill struggles to be seen and validated. 
victim service providers can help individuals bring more of themselves into shelter and other safer environments by acknowledging that they know that non-binary people exist and welcoming non-binary individuals through overt signs of welcome. For example, um, through intake forms or through dialogue or through asking about name and gender and pronouns. In, the late, uh, in late 2016, the UCLA Center for Health Policy Research released new findings from the California Health Interview Survey, the largest state health survey in the nation. More than 20,000 Californians, including adults, teenagers, and children, are interviewed each year. In 2016, they reported that 4.5% of youth aged 12 to 17 said that they um, are gender nonconforming. These studies and other data lead, lead us to believe that the number of non-binary individuals is both high and is growing every year. As more and more pa parents are supportive of their gender diverse children, as more and more schools are welcoming a broader range of gender in their classrooms, and as the world shifts to encompass greater diversity of all types, we will likely see the numbers of non-binary individuals continue to increase. Some of the many terms that non-binary people use to describe their gender identity are things like gender neutral, gender variant, gender fluid, polygender, pangender, mixed gender, third gender, gender queer, agender, neutroy, demi-boy, demi demi-girl. Other non-binary identity terms are specific to particular cultures, such as two-spirit or aggressive, speaking to the long history of non-binary genders in many indigenous and people of color communities. Some people ask, why are there so many different words that non-binary people use for their identities, expressions, and personal pronouns? Why isn't there just a singular, single identity term or a single gender neutral pronoun for all non-binary people to make things simpler and easier? Well, the answer is that there is no single non-binary identity. Each non-binary person's identity is unique and deserves to be respected. Also, each non-binary person has to often forcibly make space for themselves and their identity in the world due to the cultural lack of acceptance of the fact that non-binary people exist. Using the language that a non-binary person uses for themselves is a primary way to show respect for their self-determination. Therefore, it's essential, no matter how uncomfortable um, or uncommon it might be um, that a non-binary person refers to themselves or what language they use, um, it's important to use the language that the person is using. Um, and as victim service providers, we know that um, it's vital to be person-centered and survivor-centered, and, and respecting some of these languages is part of that equation. Um, another interesting piece of data out of the, the U.S. Transgender Survey is that um, they noted that um, respondents used over 500 unique identity terms. So there's just a lot of words that are coming out um, for both non-binary identities as well as trans identities. Some non Non-binary people use the pronouns she or he to refer to themselves, but many do not, favoring pronouns like they or z or per. Others use no pronouns at all, using uh, their name instead of a pronoun. In the US Transgender Survey um, from 2015, the most widely used pronouns for non-binary individuals were tied with the typically binary associated pronouns. So at 37% were he and his, and 37% was she and her. And the next highest pronoun that were, was used was the singular they or their, used by 29% of respondents. Most non-binary individuals, 84%, use a pronoun that is different from the one that would typically be associated with the sex on their birth certificate. In contrast to trans men and trans women, non-binary individuals often avoid asking to be referred to by their correct pronouns. For example, in work settings, 66% of non-binary people don't ask to be referred to by their correct pronoun, in contrast to 34% of trans men and trans women. Because of the fact that fewer non-binary people are asking others to use their correct name and pronouns, it's even more important for agency, agencies and victim service providers to overtly make space for and ask about every individual's name and pronoun. 
in this webinar, we'll we'll use um, the most common um, pronoun, which is they, the singular they, to refer to non-binary survivors. Non-binary individuals may pursue medical or legal action similar to trans men or trans women. Um, so we wanted to start with hormones and, and talk about surgery a, a little bit as well. So a large majority of trans men and trans women, 95%, ha, uh, have wanted hormone therapy compared to 49% of non-binary respondents. Transgender men and women are about five times more likely to have ever had hormone therapy than non-binary respondents. Non-binary individuals sometimes have had or pursue surgery to align their body with their gender identity. Gender-related surgery, however, is less common than the use of gender-affirming hormones. For example, individuals assigned female at birth may have had chest surgery or the removal of uh, breast tissue or a hysterectomy. The chart on the screen shows a comparison between trans men and non-binary individuals who had a female on their original birth certificate. As the chart indicates, 36% of trans men have had chest surgery versus only 6% of non-binary individuals. Similarly, 14% of trans men have had a hysterectomy versus only 2% of non-binary individuals. When we look at those who are assigned male at birth, there are also some dramatic differences in choices related to gender-affirming surgery or other procedures. For example, only 1% of non-binary individuals with male on their birth certificates have had an orchiectomy or the removal of the testes compared to 11% of trans women. Likewise, 1% of non-binary individuals have had vaginoplasty or the creation of a vagina compared to 12% of trans women. When it comes to electrolysis, 13% of non-binary individuals have had, the, had hair removal versus 48% of trans women. Non-binary individuals may make legal changes related to their name or gender and on accompanying documents, um, identity documents. Many do not. Keeping in mind that many non-binary people are not transitioning from one gender to another, there is some interesting data that comes from the US Transgender Survey. Transgender men and women who have transitioned were more likely to have, had, to, to have updated their name on various types of ID than non-binary respondents who had transitioned. For example, 61% of transgender men and women who had transitioned changed their name on their driver's license, in contrast to 39% of non-binary respondents who had transitioned. 88% of non-binary individuals who indicated that none of their IDs or records had the gender they preferred reported reported that it was because of the available gender options, male or female, did not fit their gender identity. In the United States, um, we're a country where there are only two options that are available on state and federal identity uh, documents. Some cities and universities are developing IDs with options in addition to male and female, but most of those forms of documentation are not recognized for voting or check caching or other day-to-day -day interaction which require identification. When working with survivors, some may, wish, some may wish to pursue legal action against their perpetrator or may seek to um, access a restraining order. Non-binary individuals were more than twice as likely to report having a negative experience when seeking legal services, in contrast to transgender men and women. This may or may not deter non-binary survivors from seeking legal services, but it may mean that victim advocates may need to be aware of the increased potential for negative experiences and step up their advocacy as necessary. I'm going to turn things over now to Laurie, who will talk about uh, rates of IPV and SA. Thank you, Michael. We don't have much data specifically on non-binary individuals when it comes to intimate partner violence and sexual assault. There's a lot more data available on youth who are non-binary or gender non-conforming and the rates of bullying they are experiencing at school and in other environments. What the following are from generalized studies that look at the broad trans community. A 2015 meta-analysis by the Williams Institute reported that of all vectors of transgender people, 
between 31 and 50 percent experience intimate partner violence in their lifetime, and between 25 and 47 percent experience intimate partner sexual assault in their lifetime. Similar findings were confirmed in the recent U.S. trans survey, reporting that 54% of their large sample of trans people had experienced some form of intimate partner violence. We do not currently have the breakdown by gender or gender vector in that 54%. The U.S. Transgender Survey report did detail rates of lifetime sexual assault. Sexual assault was high across all categories including non-binary individuals. The report notes that 51% of non-binary individuals with female on their original birth certificate had been sexually assaulted, and 41% of non-binary people with male on their original birth certificate had experienced sexual assault. These figures compare to 58% of trans men and 37% of trans women. It's also important to look at data about non-binary survivors who have had negative experiences when seeking services. Previous discriminatory interactions will impact the survivor's likelihood of reaching out for services in the future. In the U.S. Uh, transgender survey, 19% uh, of non-binary individuals who had accessed domestic violence shelters in the past year that had negative experiences there. Historically, the majority of domestic violence shelters have been sex segregated and accessible only to non-trans women and their young children. This has often meant that survivors who are other genders, including non-trans men, trans men, trans women, as well as non-binary or gender non-conforming individuals, have not been served or have not had equal access to shelter. We encourage you to check out the two other webinars in this series focusing on trans men and on trans women and how shelters can better serve those populations. Even though a large number of shelters still serve only women, there are new federal mandates that require agencies to provide equal or comparable services to all survivors of all genders. Federal laws, however, aren't the only reasons shelters are working hard to house and provide shelters to people of all genders. Many shelters have come to recognize that it is, quite simply, the right thing to do. We realize that for many of you listening, you might feel challenged by how to move forward to creating shelter environments that are welcoming to people of all genders. We hope that this is one of many resources that will help you better serve more of the survivors who need shelter and services. When working with non-binary survivors, there is no one-size-fits-all type of shelter environment that will work for everyone. Of course, this is also true for all genders of survivors. No person is a one-size-fits-all. Some non-binary survivors may be best served in sex-segregated shelters, while others will thrive better in gender-integrated shelters. Some non-binary survivors may not fit or feel the safest in communal shelter of any kind, but may benefit from working closely with an advocate to find a patchwork or set of alternatives that will best respect their gender and their safety concerns. Many of you are familiar with the Violence Against Women Reauthorization Act of 2013 and the added grant condition that prohibits discrimination by recipients of certain Department of Justice funds. It states, no person should be denied benefits or be subjected to discrimination on the basis of actual or perceived sex, gender identity, or sexual orientation, among other protected categories. For more details about the non-discrimination conditions in the reauthorized VAWA, we encourage you to read the April 2014 U.S. Department of Justice Office of Justice Programs Office for Civil Rights Brief 11-page Frequently Asked Questions document that addresses key changes in VAWA, available at the URL at the top of your screen. This document outlines far more than we will cover today and is critically important for all shelter staff to know about. 
We do want to point out one small section from the Department of Justice Frequently Asked Questions Guidelines, which focuses on comparable services. If a shelter program operates a sex-segregated facility, it is important to keep in mind that the valid non-discrimination condition now requires the provision of comparable services to those who cannot be housed in a sex-segregated facility with other survivors. The Department of Justice's Frequently Asked Questions document defines comparable this way, quote, a comparable service is one that is designed to confer a substantially equal benefit. Factors that DOJ will consider, either individually or in the aggregate as appropriate, in determining whether services are comparable include the following, the nature and quality of the services provided, the relative benefits of different therapeutic modalities or interventions, geographic location or other aspects of accessibility, the characteristics of the facilities where services are provided, and the characteristics of the individuals who provide the service. Services need not be identical to be comparable, but they must be of the same or similar quality and duration. The new non-discrimination provisions, the cost of developing and running multiple service systems, and the continuing emergence of best practices in serving trans and non-binary survivors of IPV, sexual assault, dating violence, and stalking, all point towards FORGE's strong recommendation that shelters move toward creating gender-integrated services whenever possible. We aren't going to go into greater detail about the VAWA non-discrimination conditions in this webinar. If you'd like to learn more, we encourage you to check out the resources on this slide, with, uh, which include the DOJ's um, Frequently Asked Questions, a, web, a webinar done by FORGE and NCABP, and FORGE's new webinars on sheltering trans men and sheltering trans women. Non-binary survivors may be reluctant to call and ask for emergency housing. They, like many others, often believe that shelter is only available to non-trans women, so may not reach out to see if options are available to them. Non-binary survivors have equal rights to access safe and respectful shelter. When shelters are integrated, this right can be more easily actualized, smoothly welcoming a non-binary survivor into an agency shelter environment. When shelters are segregated by sex or gender, non-binary survivors may face a difficult challenge since most will not align with the binary segregated options of male and female. A question that we have gotten is this. A non-binary survivor of intimate partner violence who presents with mixed masculine and feminine traits is seeking access to shelter. Because the sur survivor is non-binary, they may have needs that are not adequately addressed by any sex-segregated or sex-specific program an agency offers. What should the agency do to serve non-binary survivors? The answer is that the VAWA non-discrimination grant condition allows for sex-segregated or sex-specific services when it is necessary to the essential operation of the program. And under these circumstances, a non-binary survivor should be assigned to the group or service which corresponds most closely to the gender with which they identify. If the shelter segregates its services or some of its services are based on sex, then the shelter should allow this non-binary survivor to choose the group which most appropriately meets their needs and safety. A non-binary survivor would not be faced with such a dilemma if the shelter provides integrated services. We believe it is more valuable to you as shelter staff and victim advocates to share some case examples versus spending too much more time with reminders of procedures or concrete steps to take. We encourage you to watch the archived Sheltering Trans Men and Sheltering Trans Women webinars, which do go into more detail as well as downloading the eight tip sheets on sheltering trans folks, all of which are available on the FORGE website.
Before the case examples, let us give you the Cliff Notes version of some critical reminders in working with non-binary survivors who are entering shelter. One, name and pronoun. And the guidance is very simple. Ask, listen, and use. On documentation, shelter and other advocates should be asking everyone for the same types and levels of documentation, not creating burdensome requests of any incoming resident. As we mentioned before, many non-binary individuals will not have documentation that aligns with their gender or current name. Plain and simple, a person's gender is what they say it is. It is an up for discussion or question. Everybody needs and deserves bodily privacy. This may be especially true for non-binary individuals. Working with survivors to maximize their safety and comfort with regards to their bodily privacy will ultimately help create a space of deeper healing and safety. Like sleeping arrangements, everyone deserves ample bathroom and shower privacy. Bathrooms and showers don't need to be an issue for trans people or for non-trans people. Providing all gender bathrooms, locks, shower curtains or dividers, and other forms of privacy and access aids will make it more comfortable for most everyone. Supplies. Some non-binary individuals may need specific supplies, clothes, prosthetics, and medications. Just like with any other survivor, working closely with each client, you can determine what is needed and how to access those needed materials. Privacy and confidentiality. Of course, the VAWA confidentiality provision covers all residents. Keep in mind that non-binary individuals would, may not be out about their gender identity, and this information should be included under those confidentiality provisions. All shelters are aware of and address bias when it arises. When a non-binary survivor is in shelter, it's important to apply bias-reducing strategies to any conflicts that may arise and work hard to create an environment of respect for all individuals. Of course, we know you are already doing this. For all survivors leaving an abusive situation and entering shelter, safety is paramount. There may be added layers of safety concerns for non-binary survivors, including fears of others in shelter or shelter staff being discriminatory or abusive. When possible, affirm actions taken to assure the safety of all residents and brainstorm any specific concerns the non-binary survivor has about their safety. We'd like now to share three case examples. All are very different from each other and they, to help highlight some of the challenges and navigation needed to house these three individuals. We're going to start with Jamie, who's an 18-year-old freshman at a state university. They are on a full scholarship, which includes tuition, room, and board, based on their high school academic excellence. Jamie had lived with their parents in a small community and had rarely been in larger cities during their childhood. Being at college has been an exhilarating and overwhelming new experience for Jamie, as it is for so many young college students. For the first time, Jamie is living in the dorms with a roommate, dating, and also exploring their gender in ways they didn't feel comfortable doing when living at home and in their rural community. Jamie had been dating another non-binary non classmate, Aiden, for two months. Jaden wa I'm sorry, Jamie wanted to take things slow since Jamie had never been sexually active and also felt a lot of gender-related discomfort with their body. Aiden, however, was comfortable in their sexuality and eager to begin a sexual relationship with Jamie. After two months, Jamie told Aiden they wanted to stop dating and just be friends. Aiden wouldn't take no for an answer and began stopping by Jamie's dorm room, insisting on coming in and talking and hanging out. Aiden also knew Jamie's class schedule and was regularly showing up at Jamie's classes. 
One night, when Aiden was in Jamie's dorm room, not invited by Jamie nor wanted, but Jamie was unable to get Aiden to leave, Aiden started to kiss and touch Jamie in ways that were not comfortable or consensual. Aiden's behavior escalated from kissing to touching Jamie's chest to touching Jamie's genitals. Aiden finally left the dorm room, and Jamie immediately called a local advocacy hotline, asking about if there was anywhere Jamie could stay for the night because they couldn't stay in their dorm room. Jamie met with an advocate in person, and they discussed what happened. The advocate listened and asked some questions about reporting the incident to the campus Title IX office or campus residence life staff. Jamie was very concerned about two primary things. One was losing their scholarship, and two was being outed as non-binary to campus staff or to other students. Jamie reached out because the stalking needed to stop, and Jamie needed to feel able to sleep in peace at night, go to classes without being followed, and be free from unwanted sexual touch. As Jamie and the advocate talked, the advocate used the phrase sexual assault. Jamie was initially confused and then became angry and felt that the advocate wasn't listening. Jamie firmly believed that sexual assault was penetration by a penis, and that wasn't what happened. As Jamie pushed back the chair and was getting up to leave, angry about not being heard, the advocate was able to gently draw Jamie back in, promising to listen more. And in the process would also help Jamie learn more about the wide range of behaviors that can be considered sexual assault. Together they created a safety plan for how Jamie could navigate going to classes, as well as a plan of how to interact with campus staff in ways that would not compromise Jamie's scholarship and would maximize the probability that Jamie's or the other student's gender identity would not be disclosed in the process. The advocate was able to find temporary housing for Jamie until they could meet with campus staff to figure out how to find other housing on campus and initiate action against Aiden with the primary intention of stopping the stalking behavior. Michael is going to talk now about case number two. Thanks, Larry. So case number two is about Madison. Madison is a non-binary 25-year-old who just, just left an emotionally abusive relationship. They connect with a local DV agency and discuss their options with an advocate. Madison has a history of being highly involved in queer, feminist, and racial justice organizations and issues. Their appearance is a cross between a hipster and a punk rocker. They often dress in black stockings, Doc Martin boots, plaid skirts, ripped t-shirts beneath large button-down shirts. They're usually highly adorned with many rings and necklaces, as well as wide leather watch bands and a bandana that holds back their hair. They are generally bold and very confident in their in their day-to-day -day life, and they're quick to talk about their non-binary gender identity. The advocate uh, notes that they only have a women's shelter available. They discuss that the shelter is open for people who identify as women. They also talk about the fact that Madison needs to feel safe in whatever shelter option they pursue. In stereotypical ways or definitions, Madison doesn't look or sound female, in big quotes. However, Madison does align more with women, with feminists, with queer femmes than with any other gender. They decide that the women's shelter is the best option for Madison. Before entering shelter, they have a long discussion about how they will address possible comments or concerns or even complaints from other shelter residents or staff. Madison is well aware that their gender expression isn't what most people expect from someone in a women's shelter. Madison's voice is also low, and many people often perceive their voice to be that of a man's. Oops, sorry. They jointly decide that they will not proactively address any potential issues other, with other residents to avoid creating a problem that might not otherwise surface. They further agree that should, it, should concerns be raised in shelter, staff will address the issue this way. Staff will say, this is a women's only shelter, and we can assure you that everyone who is currently here is supposed to be here. They will answer any follow-up questions with, we do not discuss individual residents with other residents. 
that would be violating confidentiality, and we don't do that. And Larry's going to bring us into case number three. Thank you. Richard and Mary meet with an advocate. Richard is a 65-year-old successful businessman. He enjoys getting up each morning and putting on one of his power suits, bold ties, and highly shined shoes. He is highly respected by his colleagues and loves every aspect of his career. Mary is a 65-year-old, old-school, modern-day Southern Belle. She enjoys playing bridge with her friends, participating in a monthly out-to-brunch group, and reading novels alone at home in front of the fireplace. Richard and Mary are the same person. Richard is very comfortable and happy with his male gender identity, gender expression, name, and he, him, his pronouns. He enjoys all aspects of being traditionally masculine and male. That is, during work hours. Mary is very comfortable and happy with her female gender identity, gender expression, name, and she, her, hers pronouns. She enjoys all aspects of being traditionally feminine and female, that is, during the evenings and weekends. Richard slash Mary have no intention of tra transitioning or shifting the balance of living as male for work and female the rest of the time. If pressured for a word, they would call themselves bi-gendered. They are comfortable in both, bin in both binary genders and those around them definitely recognize them and validate them in each of those binary genders. Richard slash Mary opened their home to a younger homeless person they met, hoping to get that person on the right track. Unfortunately, the younger person turned out to be violent and threatening, and Richard slash Mary feels like they need to find a safe place to live immediately in order to sort out how to get the homeless person evicted. The local LGBT community center refers Richard slash Mary to a local shelter that they say has housed LGBT people before. As Richard slash Mary talks to the advocate, Richard slash Mary explains how they live and wonders how that will work in the shelter. The advocate assures Richard slash Mary that the shelter is all gender, so it will be no problem. But Richard slash Mary says they are concerned about what other residents will think. Together they decide that what will be most comfortable for Richard slash Mary is for them to create and put up by Richard slash Mary's room where other residents can see it. A welcome our newest resident Richard slash Mary poster with pictures of them as both male and female. Staff will also introduce Richard slash Mary in group, identifying them by the name that matches the gender they are presenting at presenting as either Richard or Mary, and explaining that res residents may also see Richard slash Mary when they are dressed a different way. Any additional questions will be deflected, encouraging people to get to know Richard slash Mary before they begin asking personal questions. Richard slash Mary is pleased with the plan and excited about their new adventure. At this point, we're going back to Michael to talk about resources. All right. Thanks, Larry. So we wanted to wrap up today's webinar with a few resources and a few reminders. On our website, we have um, many resources available to you, including um, some of uh, people's favorite formats, which are short format tip sheets or fact sheets. So um, what's on the screen right now is probably most applicable to this webinar, um, which is a pronoun conjugation fact sheet, um, which is very appropriate for, for non-binary survivors. Um, also on our website, for terms of fact sheets or tip sheets, are um, you know, short documents that talk about who trans people are, who um, what the terms paradox is, which is kind of a forge branded term, um, things about master status and universal design. Um, also, no one tell why fact sheet. So many different fact sheets that um, are quick reads and um, will get you easy information. 
in addition to those more generalized fact sheets, we have um, eight fairly recent uh, tip sheets that are specifically on sheltering trans folks. So we encourage you to, to download all of them. Um, and again, they're, they're two to three pages each, so a very quick read and a very um, easy way to um, get information. We encourage all of you to um, look at and download and share with your trans and non-binary survivors um, a trans-specific safety planning tool, which is very useful for trans and non-binary survivors themselves to use, as well as for you who are working with a trans or non-binary survivor. So we encourage you to take a look at that and, um, and use it in your work with, with trans and non-binary folks. We have three documents that are um, in process right now that correspond with these three different webinars. So uh, corresponding with this one is the sheltering non-binary individuals, and we have two other additional longer documents on sheltering trans women and sheltering trans men, and they should be available in early 2017. Like I mentioned uh, earlier in this webinar, we have over 50 hours of archived webinars on our website. Um, all of them are trans-specific, and all of them are intended for victim service providers. So you may enjoy um, watching ones like uh, safety planning for trans folks, um, the violent non-discrimination conditions that Lori mentioned earlier, working with trans survivors in rural communities, um, webinars on creating a trans welcoming environment. We have a, a webinar that's um, joint with another agency that talks about legal systems and IPV and trans people. So many webinars that are going to be very appropriate to the work that you do and just focus on an individual slice of, of skills or, or topics. We also want to let you know that we are very open and eager to supporting you in a more direct one-on-one -on -one way. So we encourage you to email us or call us or connect with us in some way with any individual questions that you might have in working with a trans client or a non-binary client. Um, we're happy to work through those challenges with you, um, and we're also happy to hear your successes if you have um, some positive news to share as well. Uh, we also do a fair amount of of direct training with agencies who request. So feel free to reach out for us with us if you'd like additional TA or additional training. And a couple of reminders to, to wrap things up today. As we've talked about many times, today non-binary individuals um, are less likely to have their names legally changed um, as compared to trans men or women. So it's, it's really important to make sure that we ask and listen and use the names and pronouns that a client shares with us. Um, it's useful in terms of building rapport and trust. The second reminder is um, that there are a high number of non-binary individuals uh, compared to trans men and women. Um, there's a higher number. Um, there's also a growing number of young people who are identifying as non-binary or gender non-conforming. So it's, it's likely that you'll see uh, potentially more non-binary individuals accessing your services than even trans men or trans women. The third reminder is that non-binary individuals are often experiencing um, high levels of victimization from early in childhood, um, through bullying or through ostracizing from their peers or their family, and that violence continues throughout adulthood. So um, it's important to remember that there, there are high rates of victimization and sometimes not so high rates of reaching out. The fourth reminder is about equal or comparable services. So when working closely with non-binary individuals, uh, determine the best option for shelter with them, keeping in mind that the services provided should be the same as for uh, women or for men, and should be uh, comparable in terms of safety and therapeutic modality, geographic location, and other aspects of accessibility. Um, where we mentioned some of those other characteristics before. So it, it's important to keep in mind that, that you know, equality or comparability is, is really important when serving any survivor. And the last reminder is about creating a culture of respect that supports all survivors. As, as many of you already do, um, intentionally creating an environment of respect is essential for all survivors who have just come out of abusive relationships. So as you continue to create these spaces in your everyday work, trans and non-trans survivors will benefit and will feel supported. We're really glad that you joined us today for this, this topic that, that isn't often discussed um, in sheltering non-binary survivors. 
um, we'd love to hear your comments and feedback, so please feel free to email us at askforge at forge-forward.org or visit our website and um, find us through the uh, contact us box on the, on the website. Thank you again for your commitment to trans and non-binary survivors, and we look forward to connecting with you on other webinars. <laughs>